Welcome back to the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. I'm Aaron Brightman. Happy to have David Anderson with us today. Before we get going, wanted to say, as always, this episode is brought to you by Knights of the Raritan, the Rutgers NIL Collective. Click on the link for their free newsletter in the description of this episode. They give uh, updates on all their activities upcoming for the fall and winter seasons, as well as opportunities for how to become a member to help Rutgers student-athletes with NIL. David Anderson's here back today. We're going to discuss the recent launch college football game that's been highly anticipated. Talk about some player ratings as well as some historical looks at Rutgers in the video game world. So if you're really excited about the launch, this will be a great episode for you. David, let's first start with some historical thoughts on Rutgers football uh, in video game world. Sure. So as someone who I wouldn't call myself a gamer, but the only video game I currently own is the NCAA football 14 for, I guess it's on PlayStation three. I'd have to even look back at even what console it's on. Um, but uh, you know, historically speaking, the first appearance of any Rutgers player, I think in any video game was Bill Pickell in the original Tecmo bowl uh, from an NFL standpoint. I mean, in the original college games, they didn't have licensing obviously, which plays into the NIL uh, you know, landscape of today. So the first time I believe Rutgers appeared in a college football video game was in what was called College Football USA, which is 96, which was the next installment after the Bill Wall series, which became the EA Sports series, which became where we are today with uh, College Football 2025. It's not called NCAA football, I guess, because of licensing reasons. But uh, the game is back after, again, the last edition being called NCAA 14. So I'm excited, even though I don't really have as much time as I used to, to partake in such video game activity. So I guess my question to you back when you were at Rutgers is, were people playing probably what, Game Breaker or Game Breaker 98 that probably featured the Rutgers football team, if I had to guess? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, it's, it, it's a haze. But yeah, we, we had something, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but obviously that was really popular and, and also the basketball game too, so... But, uh, you know, and obviously playing Madden all those years as well, there was always the hope that they'd have a college version. And then, like you said, the Bill Walsh game came out and then that became EA Sports. So that was uh, fun. So, yeah, I mean, I played all that, you know, well into past my college days uh, <laughs> as well. Um, in terms of this new game, uh, a lot of people have talked about the new features and all that. It became available this week. Uh, yep. is there anything I guess you want to just touch on in terms of that you're – excited about that you've heard or read that is a new feature in the game i know there's been a lot of talk about you know the authenticity of you know traditions and the stadiums and uh i've, I've heard some grumblings about not not Rutgers specifically uh but I, I i know in terms of some schools are kind of represented better than others uh any thoughts just on the functionality that you've heard of or, or any other things i guess you're looking forward to i guess there is a cannon crew for Rutgers, which is good uh, but, uh, yeah, any thoughts there before we get into player grades? Well, I mean, the biggest, uh, news, I guess that people are talking or complaining about again, it just became available for pre people who pre-ordered the deluxe edition from what I understand is that people are saying Colorado is rated way too high. That's like the biggest takeaway. Um, <laughs> I haven't, people haven't really had time to play, for example, the new dynasty mode. I know that in the past, you know, they always kind of tinkered with how much road to glory where you could like start out as a player in high school and then get yourself recruited and stuff like that. I, ha I haven't heard too much about how that has been tinkered. But yeah, I mean, it seems like the focus is less on gameplay because at this point, like for those people who have played Madden for the last so many, I mean, there's only so many improvements that they can make without it being too weird. So it seems like the focus, like you said, is on the tradition, the fight songs, like the cannon, like making the stadium feel, feel really good. I mean, that's really where it seems like the focus is though. Again, I haven't played it personally yet to compare to say like, is it easier to complete passes than it was in the most recent edition of the game from over a decade ago? So I'll have to provide an update if I ever get my hands on it. But uh, like I said, right now, I don't really have a lot of time to be playing the actual game, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Uh, but definitely some of the player ratings are interesting. Uh, and worth going over, I think, uh, anywhere you want to start in particular in terms of uh, things that jumped out to you. Well, first, I just want to give a credit to Richie O'Leary with the 
night report his night report records at rivals.com who i think posted all of the player grades like i think he was one of the first people to have it and so i haven't really been on the message boards or anything i don't know what people are saying about it but i guess the first thing that jumps out at me is just uh aaron lewis i mean aaron lewis has gotten a really high grade which makes sense because one of the things that you have to keep in mind is they have to try to make the game uh two parts a playable so that certain teams aren't like too strong or two players are, are too good. But then at the same time, they also have to bounce it out on the flip side to be like, how do we make this team reach a level that is probably appropriate for how their wins and losses? Because if you look at last year, Rutgers would have had like, if they had the game last year, Rutgers would have had like one of the worst offenses in the entire game. So to make up for that, to have a team finish seven and six, what you're going to make their defense like a top 10, like in terms of, the video game ratings. So I think one area, like I, I think Aaron Lewis is a good player, obviously, but do I think he's faster in terms of his speed than Wesley Bailey? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a practice to see a, a, a foot race, but the, some of the things I think you wanted to bring up was just how, how sometimes speed ratings in the games, historically speaking, or even now might just be confusing to say the least. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head when when you sent me these ratings. I'm looking at it, and that was the first thing that stuck out of me. It was like, how is Aaron Lewis five points higher in speed than Wesley Bailey? That made no sense to me. Obviously, acceleration is a high score for him. That makes sense. Strength, all right. that. But Aaron Lewis, yeah, listed at 87 overall. I I, I do think that makes sense. But uh, speed 83, Wesley Bailey 78 overall, speed 78. Uh, so, yeah, that, that one definitely is a little funky. I mean, there's a few. What, one thing I wanted to point out before I forgot was you mentioned the offense defense. So the offensive rating is overall is 81, and the defense is just 82. I thought that was an interesting decision. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I have to play the game to figure out, like, is it – is our offensive rating just skewed in a certain way because otherwise the defense just – tackles everybody all the time. I mean, I remember uh, one of the Madden tournaments from a couple of years ago where you basically have like a salary cap and you draft your players and a guy had, had picked all like the best defensive players in the league. Again, this is Madden, but like, roughly the gameplay is the same. And it's also ES sports like historically. Right. And so basically what he did was he got an entire defense of like all the best players. And then because of that, the offenses he played against couldn't do anything like they couldn't couldn't do anything. So it's possible that like they're just the way the gameplay works, especially because they haven't had it for several years. That might just be skewed. But, yeah, I would agree with you. Like it doesn't really make sense overall. And then the other thing would be like if you look at the individual ratings, like the Rutgers wide receiver room, not considered particularly good. And their offensive line has pretty good depth in terms of the number of guys who are like a 75 or higher, but they don't, they only have one guy who's even above an 80, which is Holland Pierce. So it does seem like it's more of just their overall offensive rating is not necessarily seeming like a composite of the actual individual players. The other thing I'll say about that is like, sometimes with the gameplay, like smart people from back, you know, let's say you're playing NCAA 04, which is considered the biggest breakthrough. I mean, 06 was considered maybe the best version of the game ever, but 04 had so many new features that when you looked at that, like, I'll be honest, I would just put Nate Jones, who was a Rutgers defensive back. I would just, because he had such good speed, I would just make him play running back, like Wildcat quarterback before Wildcat was even a thing. Like, because you could manipulate how your your team was by doing like tricks like that so it's it's possible that they have to also make the offensive rating a certain way to avoid like people like literally pun intended gaming the system yeah. um i mean one of my other favorite players i used to do that with was chris baker who was a Rutgers, uh who was a quarterback but then he became a wide receiver tight end but like you could use him as like a quarterback, especially in goal line situations. And you could either just run a QB sneak or if the defense wasn't covering your receivers, because the, in the game back then, sometimes if they did like the goal line, there would just be receivers wide open. He had the arm to at least just throw it to a guy open. So like perhaps there's just some, some nuances in how the games develop. That's why the offensive rating is as like it is, you know? Yeah, speaking of that, I always used to like uh, bring a Jabu Lovelace off the bench and uh, just just run him to death and <laughs> out of the option. 
Uh, oh, absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, so, so some ratings on the – let's go on the offense. Some offensive ratings to ju- uh, jump out. Obviously, Ethan Kalik Manis, he's a 76 overall. Kyle Monungai was rated one of the top 100 players in the entire game. He's at a 90 overall. Nine. Sam Brown is at 79. Uh, in terms of wide receivers, Demir Miller and Christian Dremel are both 82 overall. Big drop off from there. And Asim Brantley, 74. Ian Strong, 71. That seems low. Uh, pretty much everybody else is in the 60s, aside from Chris Long at 71. And then, uh, yeah, like you said, the offensive line, Holland Pierce at 86. Gus Link is pretty good, 79. I, I, I would take that. And then uh, Reggie Sutton, 77. Felter, 75. Asamoah, 75. Strederick Road, 75. Needham, 75. Uh, so, solid. Uh, but any anything that jumped out at you about the offense in terms of individual readings? Sure. So, I mean, the first thing would just be, I guess if we talk about, first of all, Sam Brown, you take Sam Brown, Brantley, Long, even like a Tyler Needham. I mean, when the makers of these games, they usually just try to hedge a lot when it comes to players who are in, have had recent injuries. So I know Brown came on strong late last year, but also I don't know how many people were involved in making their ratings for this game. So for a while, there was one guy in Madden, one human being who did all the ratings for the entire game. And so like right before he retired from doing it was when uh, social media guys would be posting like videos of them, you know, Hey, watch me on this touchdown. Like I should get more speed, like type of thing. I know it was a big, uh, you know, big, it would have been a dream job for a lot of our fans. I have to be honest, but I think for injured players, a lot of times they're, they're not sure if a guy's going to come back strong. It's also possible with certain players that the way that they improve, right? Because in college, a lot of, like, each year, like every guy gets better. And so they leave a lot of room for growth. And I don't know if the person who was doing this or people, if it's a team, they know like how many years of eligibility certain players have left. So sometimes they'll underrate a guy because they know like we can't make him too good or else um, he'll get too good in, in a dynasty mode. The other thing that I would say is that uh, for receivers, like for example, Ian Strong, and even Nassim Brantley, because they're bigger guys, you because their height and weight, sometimes they get underrated because they would just be too good. Um, one of the common criticisms of NCAA, or I'm sorry, of Madden 04 was that Michael Vick could just scramble around forever because of his speed, and then he could just throw a jump ball to Brian Finneran, who was like not even that good in real life, but because of his height and weight and strength, like it was impossible to stop. So it's sometimes possible that in these games, the uh, the makers have to like kind of be careful with bigger guys, to not make them too dominant with their with their size and speed. So I guess that's the main takeaway. And I guess I'm also realizing I'm probably using a lot of terms like dynasty mode. So basically, just for our listeners who aren't as familiar, what you can do is you can play as Rutgers with the current roster, and then after the season is over. You're, you can go through and you can recruit players like made up players from high school, and then you can advance them into the year 2025, 2026, 2027. And each year, the players like improve their individual ratings assigned by the computer. And so um, that makes it kind of fun that, you know, you could go back in time and play as Rutgers and NCAA football, let's say 11 and you could just play in dynasty mode and eventually reach the year 2025, like we are right now. And so one of the things I have to give a special shout out, I doubt any of these people obviously listen to the podcast, but there's a group of people on a operation sports forum who would update the ratings in NCAA football 2014 so that you could keep updating the roster. So even though there was no new version of the game, these guys kept and gals kept the spirit alive and would update the rosters every year. And so for those serious fans that probably continue to play NCAA 14 uh, or did until they had two kids, like I would always go to the the website and like down and they would see how to download the new file. So that way you could kind of like keep playing forever. Like I've played many games with Gavin Wims that as my quarterback uh, for Rutgers because of the, the rosters that those uh, people had updated which is another thing I wanted to bring up to you. One of the other key takeaways people were saying is that Ethan Kelly McManus has a rating of 76. Gavin Wimsett playing for Kentucky has a rating of 75. So I saw a lot of tweets about that and people were kind of happy and got a chuckle about that. I don't know if you saw that. 
No, I did not. That uh, doesn't surprise me, though, that people were all over that. And <laughs> Dynasty mode is the best part of the game. Uh, it makes it super cool. And uh, so that, that and I, I, I have seen some tweets that said people are saying that Dynasty mode, you know, it's, it's the gameplay is like hard when you're playing against a computer. It's not uh, it's not easy. Uh, so um, another thing about quarterbacks, too, I want to mention that it, it gives a Johnny Shepard a 73 overall with a speed of 89, which is uh, right He's up. A tank. Anything else on offense? Uh, I think that's a well, tight end I didn't mention, but uh, they actually uh, have uh, Victor Kanapka as the highest rated tight end at 74, Kenny Fletcher at 69, along with Higgins at 69 as well. So that, that was interesting. Yeah, I guess two last takeaways on offense. One, uh, Devon Fuse is listed as a receiver, whereas we saw him in the spring game and in the current roster, he's still listed on the defensive side, I believe as a safety, even though he's kind of in that hybrid safety linebacker role. And then the other thing, you know, Kenny Fletcher, what's interesting is for people who were like used to play the uh, in Madden, like you could take a safety, make him a linebacker and the guy would be awesome. Same thing with college football. And so we used to do that with Rutgers players, but it was almost as if Greg Schiano kind of took that advice to the actual field <laughs> because it didn't really work for Rutgers because he had already taken most of those faster got like maybe you're a slower safety and he made you a linebacker, or you're a slower linebacker and he made you a defensive end. And then same thing with offense. Like you could pretty much turn anyone into a wide receiver, a tight end, and they would be like decent. So I'm yeah. almost curious with Kenny Fletcher, had he been a defensive end in the game and then you just changed him to a tight end, like would he immediately be just as good or like what happened there? So obviously I think that, you know, again, there's not that many people that, yeah, for Kenny Fletcher's case, like they don't know how good he's going to be. We don't even really know how effective he's going to be. So they kind of like hedge their bet with that, with his rating probably. It's funny too because if you look at the individual categories, he's actually significant. He's rated significantly higher than Kanapka in three out of the five categories. So, of the main categories, like just for people's reference, like the main categories that Aaron's mentioning: speed, strength, agility, acceleration, and awareness. But that doesn't that doesn't include like you have other ratings for like how good you are at catching the ball, okay. how good you are with running, like car- the carrying rating. But yeah, the five main categories are the main pillars of your rating. You probably got knocked on catching because they have no idea how, how he's going to be. Right, right. Exactly. Uh, Whereas so, Victor Kanapka was a former basketball player, right, who he enrolled at West Point as a basketball player. So you would think that he has pretty good hands, you know, coming out of Don Bosco and being a basketball player. So, you know, sure. sometimes, like, it happens. Uh, so defense, we touched on Aaron Lewis and Wesley Bailey a little bit. Jordan Thompson's at a uh, – so Lewis is at 87 overall. Bailey's 78. Jordan Thompson's 74. Defensive tackles, Malcolm Ray, the transfer from Florida State, 79 overall. Keontae Hamilton, 77. Uh, Jasir Peterson jumped out because his speed is 87, which is way above any. Is that a mistake? Like, that that seems like it might be not real. I, I don't know. I mean, he's way higher. I mean, Malcolm Ray and Keontae Hamilton are in the 60s, uh, predictably, uh, but their strength is really high. But, yeah, that was interesting. And then you have uh, linebackers. I mean, that, that uh, based on... The ratings uh, is the strength, uh, which in reality is to Tere, 87 overall. Tyree Powell, 83 overall. They get Moses Walker, 76. Cornerbacks, uh, Longer Beam got an 82 overall with a speed of 92, which was uh, an acceleration agility all over 90s. Strength way low, 49, which, you know. Yeah. I, I still think that's a little low, but obviously finesse player. Eric Rogers, 78. Bo Masco, 74. Uh, it's funny, too. They gave Kevin Levy 70 overall. They gave him a speed of 95. That was interesting. And acceleration. He's got a speed and acceleration of 95. So for those who may be playing the game, even though Levy is a freshman, return. like you got to use him as a return man. And also he's a type of person where, like, in the game, if you if you play him enough, his, his ratings will improve, like, his other areas will improve, so you might just put him on the field, even though he's a freshman. He's definitely going to get a little bit more burn in this video game than he probably will on Saturdays in, in the real games. Uh, I mean, I'm high on him. I've always been high on him, but, like, when you see that, like you said, like, yeah, definitely a better video game player than his play in the depth chart right now. Correct. And then safety is interesting. Flip Dixon, not the highest rated safety. Shaquan Loyal, 83 overall. Flip Dixon, 81. Desmond Egg Venusen, 77. 
feel like that's maybe a little low for him. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. uh, and then, yeah, I, I saw this, someone tweeted, I think it might've been Richie talking about Jay Patel, only 74 overall, uh, as a kicker. And then they put the new punter, Michael Hartshorn at 65. So, uh, I jumped to special teams there, but any thoughts on defense, uh, first? Yeah. I mean, I would say like, I'm not sure because about one thing, which is as defenses have now moved to more like a four, two, five and every, or a three, three, five, everybody's playing with five defensive backs. Like in the old days, what you would do in the real old days was you would just take physical safeties and put them in your lineup as a linebacker. But once they expanded the playbooks so that you actually could go into a nickel or a dime more easily, um, it made it like defensive backs were like too fast and they could always get to tackler to, to make tackles. So kind of at times made it unfair and made it kind of pointless to have linebackers. So perhaps this is a response to not having the safeties be too good, but yeah, I would agree with you. Like, I don't, I don't think anyone would say that Shaquan loyal is, let's say if it, is six points better than Desmond Ignosin, which would mean like he's like 10% of a better player in real life. Like that doesn't really make sense. I mean, Ignosin is taller. He's on Rutgers roster. He's listed at six, three, whereas uh, Loyal's listed at six foot. So again, height and weight thing might be a factor there, but yeah, I mean, I, I would not understand why flip Dixon wouldn't be the highest rating really from safeties. Like he was a top, 10 rated guy in pro football focus among all safeties nationwide last year for most of the season. So, yeah. I mean, that, that seems questionable to me. Um, but maybe they're just trying to figure out like, they don't know why he's so good. Like sometimes players get an odd rating because it's hard for the video game makers to like really put into numbers, like the person's impact. Like you could say that with Manungai as well. Like there's no way to show like, this guy gets tougher in the fourth quarter. Like I know in, in previous game modes, they have like power-ups where you can like give your team a boost in the fourth quarter, for example, but like, or sometimes there's like a clutch rating. I haven't seen if the new game has a clutch rating where, you know, obviously Manungai would be super high for something like that in terms of your clutch rating helps you like on third and goal or third and short and then, and then late game carries. So yeah, I mean, I guess that's interesting. I guess the biggest takeaway though is just the number of players. Like one of the limitations of previous iterations of the game was that you always had to cut your roster down to 70 players going into a season. And so for some years they would put a lot of freshmen in there, knowing that those guys would eventually become good, even though they're kind of not in the depth and the too deep at the time. So I'm curious because I haven't seen this particular game. Like, can you keep a roster of 85 or more? Like, I'm guessing at least 85 based on how many players are listed here. Um, I guess. The, and then the only other thing was like, there's only four defensive ends listed. Whereas I would say that's generally a position of strength and depth for Rutgers. So I know we talked about with the spring game, like DJ Allen, we're really hoping takes a big step forward. But you got to figure maybe some of these defensive tackles, like especially if Josiah Peterson has an 87 speed and in 76 acceleration, like you're playing at defensive end. Or maybe there there are some versions of the game where Mo Toure is like is already listed as a defensive end in certain lineups or something. Um, that's possible as well because you know with what we're seeing here, you know you're probably going to want to play Toure, Powell, and Moses Walker Hall if you could. So, so I have a question for you. Aside from the game itself, so let's talk about actual impact, right? In terms of the players, the team, they're obviously going to be playing this themselves quite a bit uh what do you think in terms of i mean I, what i'm curious is in terms of the playbooks and all that you know how much are they going to be able to how much can you uh i guess customize the playbooks will be interesting to see but do you think this actually in a weird way like will help players kind of be more in tune with what they're supposed to be doing on the field do you think there's any connection there at all do you think you know as coaches will, will they I'm, I'm sure coaches will vary in their opinions and probably, you know, the more time they're on this game, the less time they're in their playbook, you have to have that balance. But it's just, I, I, you know, the, the, in a way, you are making decisions, uh, you know, mentally why you play this game. Do you think there's any impact in that uh, for players? It's minimal. I mean, I would say back when I played, right, um, guys would be, first of all, 
rubing each other in the locker room, like in front of the, you know, your teammates, like, Hey, have this or that, like I'm faster than you according to this game. And then, you know, they're, they're going literally on the field after like running races against each other. So I think that from a camaraderie standpoint, like there's some factor there, but there also could be some disconnect. One of the things to keep in mind with like people who play Madden too, is there's usually periodic updates to people's skills. So I'm curious if that changes over time in terms of just like playbooks and stuff like that. If you're a newer player, which I doubt many guys would be, but let's say it's a Komoko Ture from, you know, back 10 years ago. I would guess that it's possible that he wouldn't really totally understand the nuances of like the difference between a cover three and a cover four or, and so the amount of time it takes to absorb that in actual playing is one thing, but a guy like him back then, um, like you could let him play the game and he might understand just the general defense, like a little bit more quickly than you can just show him by like having individual players stand around in a walkthrough. So like, it's possible that like, that's the main area I would say perhaps defensively uh, helps. I don't think offensively it's real enough for offensive players to like use it as a tool. Like it's not as smart as like virtual reality and they might have some virtual reality tools that they use nowadays, but it's not enough to actually figure out like, Hey, in this, like, I guess maybe you could say like in a cover three, they might line up like this, but I don't really think it helps as much on offense because like, well, like when we look at Iowa, uh, that game, I guess it was two, two years ago now, like Iowa players were smart enough that they were not just standing in their zone. Like sometimes in the video game, if a team is playing with their corners up in a zone, like guy is literally just standing there guarding the flat. Whereas in a real life situation, if there's no receivers that are on his side, especially for a more advanced team, like an Iowa Penn state defense who luckily Rutgers doesn't have to face this year. Like those players know that they're not in a video game and they're supposed to be like cheating toward where there's actually a person to cover. So, like, from an offensive standpoint, I don't think that it can possibly replicate, especially because the playbook, no matter how much you customize it, isn't actually representative of how thick your playbook is an offense. But, yeah, I mean, I would say the only way it would help would be, like, guys who who may just – especially or maybe offensive players just playing as a defensive player in there, like, maybe – like coverages or just basic concepts, it, you can you can learn a little bit about that, but it's 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 really minimal. Like we weren't using it as a tool when I played, and now like again, maybe they have some VR or something like that, or that that would be more effective. Yeah, if anything, you know, if, if they still dedicate the same amount of time to their playbooks, doing this on top of it is better than maybe doing something that you know keeps them even more locked in on football and and their own team. So there's maybe some benefit there, but I agree with you, the camaraderie, the locker room, uh, it's going to, I think maybe it'll create more bonding opportunities for the players as well. So maybe a little something there Uh, overall, any closing thoughts uh, on the uh, just being back this game, uh, college football 25, and then also the play range or anything we didn't touch on that you wanted to, to hit on. I guess the main thing would just be, Uh, to remember the reason that this game had to stop was because of NIL. They really talked about reviving it formally. It was greenlit in 2019, but then things happened with COVID and then NIL just went crazy. I think that there are, it's just an opportunity to promote the sport more. And I would say it's less of a thing in like a place like Alabama, I would say, but in an area like New York, New Jersey, where people have a lot of other things, options and things like that. I mean, one of the things that got me into really liking the team and, and following them more was I played these games. I played, as I mentioned to you offline, I played Fox Sports College Hoops 99 with the Rutgers basketball team that couldn't feature their real names. But, you know, uh, Rob Hodgson, Jeff Billett, like those guys, like I had a lot of fun, obviously, playing, even though the gameplay wasn't the, the best. And so I think that there's – there's ways that this can get into the culture as well as, you know, breed even more younger fans uh, by that happening. So I think for Rutgers, it's very critical. Like one of the things we talk about at times is when Rutgers gets good or bad at the right or wrong time in a sport, 
Like in football, they got bad totally at the wrong time in the 90s when the number of bowl games was increasing. Like if they just could have stayed good a little bit later in the early 90s, then they might have been going to a bowl game, which might have bred more success in the program. And I think that Rutgers being where they are right now is good because if this game came out in 2019, like you do not want to be the laughing stock of college football when this game comes out. Yeah, there's people who will try to resurrect the program, which may be getting you good press, but the majority of people are like, hey, if I want to play a game against a team that stinks, I'm going to play against like 2019 or 2018 Rutgers. Like that's what they do. That's what, you know, the mind of a child is is sometimes very straightforward. So I think it's good that Rutgers is on the ascent as the game is being re-released because it may allow them to um, just get a little bit of positive press from it and grow the sport and the just the college football overall uh, among the fan base and in the quote state of Rutgers, even if they are you know recruiting outside of that nowadays. Yeah, that's a great point, and uh, we'd be remiss if we did not mention that former Rutgers quarterback Ryan Hart was instrumental in the lawsuit. Very true. Sports uh, to have player representation. Uh, and to have their name, image, and likeness included, which now all the players do. I know across the board, you know, and there was different allocations, I believe, per programs. And at the end of the day, it's not a ton of money. It's a few hundred bucks, I think, for each player. But at least they are have their name. They are getting represented properly uh, in terms of their name, image, and likeness, and they're getting compensated for it. So you have to give a shout out to Ryan Hart, one of the best quarterbacks, also in program history, uh, and just the fact that players are getting NIL from it. It's pretty cool for them to be playing the game now, to see them on the game and to know that they got paid for it and they're represented well. They might have their quibbles with it, with the ratings, like you said, but uh, certainly things are a lot better now. It's a lot, aside from gameplay and realistic, you know, view and how, how it almost looks like, you know, a game on TV now, uh, which is incredible. And like you said, there's going to be more technological advancements, but that aspect of it is pretty cool as well. Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely mentioned Ryan Hart. I, if I had to guess, like what quarterback, Rutgers quarterback, I threw the most passes with in the video game probably was Ryan Hart because he was quarterbacking in like 03, 04, 05, right? I mean, even the NCAA 06, which is considered the greatest version of all time, that's really the 2005 season. So right. when they still had Hart on the roster and Rutgers reached the Insight Bowl for their first bowl game since 1978. So, I mean, definitely that was the time of my life where I had the most free time too, probably. So, uh Definitely worth mentioning, you know, Ryan Hart, who is an all-time great Rutgers player and definitely undervalued when you talk about the resurrection of the program under Greg Schiano 1.0. Yeah, my mind was going there, too. I was like, is he, is he the most underappreciated quarterback in, in Rutgers history? That might be a whole other episode, but he, I feel like he does not get his due. Uh, and also, by the way, you can look it up. I think it was episode seven. He was a guest on the Scarlet Pedal podcast. He was a great guest. Uh, I'll probably have him back at some point. But, yeah, he definitely was instrumental in the program, taking that first step, obviously, then splitting time with Mike Teal. But uh, when he arrived, that, that 2005 season. But, yeah, great player. But, yeah, reminiscent of that in terms of uh, how fun he was to play with in the, in the game and then also his impact on the game being back and players. Actually, it's funny because, you know, Geo Baker, obviously, with NIL, uh, and his impact across the board. But, you know, Rutgers also had Ryan Hart be a big factor in terms of this specific uh, EA Sports uh, game. Yeah, well, I guess and then the next question is, how does this, you know, roll over into other sports? Because now that football is kind of charging forward, I mean, in terms of college, I think there was maybe once NCAA baseball and definitely basketball, especially men's and women's hoops, perhaps may you know, also benefit from, from this. So that's, that's good there again. And if NCAA basketball comes out next year and uh, Rutgers basketball is, you know, a national team, you know, that's, that's obviously just add another cherry on top of, of the uh, step forward that they've taken. We're definitely scaring fans now, longtime fans. We're we're talking about what great timing this is for Rutgers uh, basketball. (laughs) <laughs> we'll we'll end it at that. Thank you so much for all your insight. This was fun, and I hope you found it fun as well. Thanks so much for listening and watching once again here at the Scarlet Faithful Podcast.